Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to our Lunchtime Webinar Express series. We've got a great session today with Alex Murphy, co-founder of leading financial services digital marketing agency, Balance. If you would like to turn on your webcam, Alex, I'll pass things over to you, and the floor is yours when you're ready. Thank you very much, Pippa. Yes, and today we will be talking about brand and performance in Balance. So uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for coming today and signing up. We can see we've got a good we're getting close to 100 people on the on the call at the moment and growing, so that's that's excellent. Uh, right, like like Pepper said, it'll be about half an hour if I can stick to my timing, uh, and then we'll have a Q and A at the end, so I'll answer questions then. Okay, so the contents contents is a load of questions. So who's this guy speaking to you? Um, what did he say? Uh, why are we here? Why are we here now? Uh, who should we listen to on this topic? Uh, what do we do next? How can I convince others of the same things I've learned today or around this topic? Where has this worked before? And what did we cover in the summary? Sorry. And then finally, a little bonus reading list at the end. So who's this guy? Right. So I'm Alex Murphy. I'm co-founder of Balance, uh, a digital marketing agency uh, specializing in financial services. Uh, I've been around a while now doing this sort of thing. Um, marketing is, is my first love and it's all I've ever done. Uh, I, uh, I've i worked with a number of brands, Admiral, GoCompare, The Royal Mint, and uh, that's enough about me. Okay, uh, Balanced and Agency, to very briefly mention, we do obviously all the digital marketing things like SEO, PPC, content, training, digital PR, and we've worked with some absolutely excellent financial services brands. Our teams work with them all. So. Before we start, I think it's very important that I share that um, an advisory warning. There are terms in this presentation that might uh, be distressing to marketers of a delicate disposition. So uh, let's get on with it. I'm just going to give you a fair warning. So hold on to your seats. Colouring in department. Synergy. Depends. SOSTAC. It's a CIM talk after all. The long and the short of it, and worst of all, finance department. So my apologies in advance, again. So some definitions, because we talk about brand versus performance a lot, but actually, what does that mean? Because one of the issues that we often have with brand performance is that different terms are used interchangeably. Uh, so let's talk about what they are and what they're not. Performance marketing. Yes, it usually has a short-term noticeable business effect. It tends to, the language around it tends to be things like CPA, ROAS, ROI. And it's normally something, normally something you can do in real time. You can change bids in real time. There's aspects of it that are biddable. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's generally seen as a more agile form of marketing. Uh, it does not mean digital. Yes, it is predominantly digital, but using the two interchangeably would be incorrect. Um, it does not automatically mean that it's the most efficient or cost-effective uh, form of marketing. Maybe in the moment it seems so, but not necessarily always. And it does definitely not, as we've learned in recent years, mean the most accurately, accurately measurable. It'll give you measurable results, but whether they're accurate or not is a whole other topic. Brand marketing does usually focus on building emotional connections with the customer or prospective customer. Does tend to go for broader reach to be effective and does usually have a longer window to impact business returns. That's how we think about brand marketing. Brand marketing does not just like, like with, with, with performance, it's not constrained to a channel. Brand marketing does just not mean TV or offline or expensive. It doesn't mean that there won't be short term benefits to it. It's not all a distant horizon and of course and there's all a whole other topics in this brand does not mean slogans or your your logo or anything like that it's much deeper so now we've got that clear let's move on a little dot so uh, some of you may be familiar with this this is the gartner hype cycle and it describes a lot any new technology or any new thing that people get excited about and the waves that it goes through uh, Dr. Grace Kite, who I'll mention a number of times in this talk, referenced the fact that this has um, a lot of alignment to how we've perceived online advertising 
over the last few years. Now, this curve tends to align from the early 2000s up to today and beyond. And the little cyan dot, oh, is that cyan? Baby blue dot is where we are today. Now, this also aligns with my career and why maybe I'm a good person to be talking about this stuff. Uh, obviously, uh, Royal Mint, Go Compare, Admiral Bands in that order and how they align to different phases of the hype cycle. So let's go back early 2000s. And this is why, why this is the time, why it's why we're even having presentations. That's why we've got such a good sign up today. It's not my charming wit. It's, it's the fact that this topic is so critical these days. So we'll go back to the early 2000s. I finished university and getting marketing jobs and marketing had fallen out of favor within businesses, at least the smaller, medium-sized businesses. Um, the barriers to invest in things like brand were only perceived as TV and at the time the options were limited. So TV was what people thought of as brand. That wasn't something you could do. Marketing had been consigned, and he was the first one to being a coloring in department. You know, it's where sales sent their presentation to be made. Occasionally they did um, catalogs. Um, and they say they did some brand marketing, but it was just kind of almost an indulgence perceived as rather than something critical to the business. However, then the hype cycle kicks in for digital marketing or online advertising. And then notice here I'm saying digital and online, not performance, though the two things, especially at that stage, were very, very tightly, uh, tightly linked. So online advertising. Uh, arrives and people think you can solve everything. You can see the money in and money out and measuring in real time. And this wave that we see at the beginning, I rode that as hard as I could. You know, I got an average degree and, uh, and I didn't fancy going to London. So, so if I was going to do well, I was going to have to get really good at this online advertising thing. And luckily I was, you know, and, and the teams around me were. And so I rode that wave throughout the Royal Mint and Go Compare and everyone loved it. And it was, it was great. But in that I created a problem along, alongside many other new of the first wave of digital marketers is that we got businesses a bit hooked to it. You know, before we knew it, the brand budget was being handed to us. You know, whenever the, the business was under effort, you don't leave, you leave performance marketing alone, but you, you, the brand guys, well, that TV, do we need TV right now? Cut the TV a little bit. Didn't bother me. I wasn't a brand marketer. Never would have considered myself as such. And so it was great. I was getting money handed to me with no real issues. Um, but of course, move on to the late 2000 teens. Um, and, but even before that, while I was still in Go Compare, I started noticing something. You know, the team there, the performance marketing team there was absolutely excellent and would optimize to the nth degree. You know, they were as good as digital marketing people could get. But there was a thing that happened whenever we were maybe having a lean a month and we wanted to pull back a bit and TV was pulled back or we'd had a, a period of time where, you know, you're talking budgets some tens of millions here where we want to save a couple of mil. So TV is turned off or, or really subdued for a period of time. What I noticed was the optimization of my performance marketing channels was hitting a ceiling. Couldn't explain it, didn't really understand why. Um, my rather frustrated brand manager, my colleague, he, uh, he at the time handed me a copy of Byron Shops, How Brands Grow. I think he knew what was going on. And so, yeah, that's where we were. However, I moved on to Admiral. And for the first time, I was responsible for all marketing. That was the marketing director then. Every single aspect of, of that business's marketing was suddenly my responsibility. Now, I absolutely probably got that job on, on the merit of my digital experience. You know, they, they knew that we needed to be much better at that. And was a very dom, dom, uh, starting to become rapidly dominated by price comparison acquisition. And so it, it wanted to look after its own digital um, skills and performance marketing. And when I went in, that's exactly what I thought I was going to be improving. But what I rapidly realized was that wasn't really the problem. Yes, it needed a lot of work, but it was bigger than that. So at the same time, digital was starting to fall off this hype curve, you know, we noticed actually loads of display ads were, were junk, load of, load of bots and, and very little actual value. We noticed that maybe the limitations are happening with performance marketing where there was an absence of brand, it was much harder to do anything with it. Um, we noticed that maybe uh, there was a lot of scandal about attribution models being quite inaccurate. And so we were all then developing all these attribution modeling to kind of explain something that wasn't really there. Um, 
So yeah, we were getting quite dejected and this was happening as, as I was hitting Admiral. So I'm there going, well, hold on. Um, why can't I get brand budget? Why is it so hard for me to argue brand budget? Now, of course, I was part of the problem. Like for years, being shown people, look, we can get customers nice and easily and cheaply and measurably, uh, and you know where your money goes, and that whole adage of 50% of your marketing is wasted, it's gone. So, so you be. Except, of course, that wasn't really the case. I didn't understand the full picture. I was, I was too naive. And now, of course, I was trying to argue against all of those years, going, oh, we need brand investment. And no, we can't measure it straight away, but look at all these things, which I'll go into. And what will help us get there? Um, it was very tough. Now, I did get those budgets, and it was a struggle. And, and that's the start of where I learned a lot of what I'll talk about today and continue to learn every single day. I, I had to avoid LinkedIn this morning because every single day I look at something and I learn something new and I want to change the deck. This is like version eight or something. So, so yeah, constantly learning, but we are maturing. Now digital, online, people start to realize how powerful it is for brand building as well as performance. And people start to notice the balance that's required, but we're not quite there yet, you know? And now I'm, I'm the old guy, you know? and and people are talking about TikTok and every new channel that comes along and threads and everything. And, and I'm going, how do I apply that to the business? And so, yeah, so I'm, I'm starting to know what, what the, the very talented people ahead of me were feeling like all those years ago. And at some point in the future, what we hope for is that the channels are used in balance, one of the channels, the disciplines are used in balance. Uh, not the agency, but the, the, the term balance in terms of performance and marketing work together. Yes, it's going to be predominantly online, but not just online, um, for the good of the business. So yeah, that's the herb cycle and me. So why is so that's why we're talking about this now. But why is it so top, why is it important in this particular situation? And you may have noticed the economy is a bit messed up at the moment, and it's not doing too well. Now maybe the recession didn't happen, or maybe it's not as bad as people thought, but regardless it's tight times a lot of businesses are really struggling and when you're under the cosh you're going to grab for the short-term wins you're going to want to go well look i know if my money is spent today will give me money tomorrow that's more important and you know what it often is but the businesses that that can see beyond the next three months six months a year time and time again have been proven to succeed there's loads of stuff which i couldn't go into today about how you spend through a recession and marketers who spend an advertising through a recession win and there is things to be confident about you know this is a good time because actually to the right to the left you've seen economic uh, situation at the moment so you know by 2022 it's diabolical and then you know it's a little bit the yellow box to forecast i should have a key the yellow box to forecast it, it it's not great, but it's getting better. And consumer confidence is improving. We got you know, Prime Day happening today. You know, I wonder how much money is going to be spent on that. You know, it's not like no one people aren't buying things. Right. So, so we know that's a good time. We know that things have evolved. We know that we need to put these things in balance potentially, or, but we don't really know why. What? Why are they in balance? What? What's speaking? What thoughts are out there? And we also need to understand this so we can convince others. So. Who are leading thought, who are thought leaders on this topic? Certainly not me, I'm just good at reading other people's stuff, okay? So I've talked about four people here today, there's millions of others we could talk about, but these are four quite key people. Professor Byron Sharp, uh, Les Binet, and Peter Field, Dr. Grace Kite, and Professor Mark Ritson. So let's start with Byron Sharp. So this is the book I was given by my frustrated brand manager a number of years ago, which was How Brands Grow. And Byron Sharp and the Aaron Big Bass Institute tend to talk about a certain thing called, um, they talk about mental availability and uh, physical availability. Now, on the right here, you have a little diagram done by a brilliant uh, illustrator and marketing uh, thought leader called Dan White. And Dan tends to il illustrate concepts exceptionally well. But what um, Byron Sharp talked about was that 95% of your market at any time, any point, are not in market. You know, they're not they're not ready to buy anything from toilet paper to fast cars to car insurance. You know, they're not ready to buy at that point most of the time. 95% number really is just a nominal number for saying most of the time. You know, don't get too stuck on that. But it makes sense, right? That, that of course people aren't right now, and most people aren't right now ready to buy that thing. So if you're only hitting them with activation, if you're only using uh, performance marketing to reach them, 
you're really only trying to do is really hit them on that 5%, which is a much, much harder job. You know, that was one of the strengths of digital marketing and, and performance marketing, but it's very, very hard to do. So all of our skill came from that. Meanwhile, the smarter brands are going, well, you know what, I'm going to continue to speak to my customers all the 95% of the time. Now, we used to talk this quite ephemerally, like, uh, well, we'll, e we'll send newsletters to customers throughout the year to keep them engaged um, so that when they do ready to buy, and that's all great, and that's all engagement. But real brand marketing is about building that relationship so that when they do hit what's termed a category entry point, maybe if it's champagne, it's a birthday or a wedding or something like that, maybe whatever it might be, it's that, that fast car you finally want to buy, right? Fast car, something like that. But regardless, you don't start then, you start when the 95%, and, and what Dan, Dan points out is that they're almost in this pool at the top here, waiting, and that's when you apply the brand marketing to them, and that's why it doesn't make sense to hit them with sales messages. And then when you get to that point, the category, that's when being excellent at optimization, that's when being really excellent at performance marketing comes in. If you didn't have that, they'd just stay in the top of the pan, or someone else would benefit from it. So that's how brands grow, according to Parent Shaw. Long and the short of it, I debated about putting this in, not because it isn't a fantastic piece of work, but because it's almost so ubiquitous now that it's almost starting to lose meaning. The word strategy loses meaning. And, but it is really, really important, not so much for the, the metrics involved, but because it's a, it's a way of showing, demonstrating to people how using um, data from a num num number of sources in the IPA effectiveness um, studies and reward winners, they went, this is what we observed. That when people spent this much budget, 60% of the budget, and I'll get to that number in a minute, 60% of that budget on uh, brand building um, and 40% on performance acquisition, they over time benefited. The yellow zigzaggy line essentially is your sales performance, right? So what's in your sales are happening again and again and again and again, and they're driving business. But whenever you turn off the, the promo or the, the, the tough PPC or whatever you're going for, um, sales just drops to the floor again, you know? And, but with brand building, yes, initially, when you spend the same amount of money on brand as you do on activation, you're not gonna get the results that you want. Uh, they, oh, sorry, you are gonna get results you want. You're not gonna get results that are comparable. People are gonna go, where did all that money go? You know, why didn't we just spend on doing a discount or, or spend on more price comparison or, or affiliates or whatever? And, and so you've got to manage the expectation of that as yes, initially that will be the case. But what you're doing is building a stronger baseline. So I love this chart because it's sort of, a lot of people say, well, yeah, long and short, that's great. And it came out 2015, right? Brands grows 2010. Um, that was 2013 to 2015, the, the Binet field stuff. But it's very hard to apply to real business. You know, I was doing it at the time and, and he's like, well, it's not quite that. It's not quite this. And it almost, it talked about syn synergy. Here we go, there's the word again. But it talked about synergy, but actually it was almost people think, oh, maybe I should be spending my money on brand and not on performance. What am I doing? This chart from uh, Dr. Grace Kite and the, the Magic Numbers uh, group, they, they, sounds like a band, um, they talk about the performance plateau. And the performance plateau really means that actually, if you look across time here, at the beginning of a business, it actually makes quite a lot of sense to, um, to be using performance marketing. You get a lot of growth straight away, startups, fintechs, fintech startups and, and new businesses and new, exciting new products and all those things. Performance marketing can work exceptionally well for you. Um, but what happens is you do eventually hit a plateau. Uh, and that plateau can continue until you've got something else helping it. Or in fact, you can get diminishing returns. You already get diminishing returns or regressive returns because because your competitors might well be doing this stuff, which is in the yellow box here, which is yellow, yellow peaks here, which is, this is brand building. This is when you combine the two things together, brand and performance, there is this synergy, which means that you're uplifting those channels. Now, I could talk about it a bit more later, but think about what that really is. That's when you turn on brand advertising, people have seen a brand ad and they have a stronger relationship to that brand, or it's more mentally available. When they see them in front of them in price comparison, or in Google, or on Amazon, or whatever, they, they have a preference. You know, it's the one that they maybe think of searching for at, the, at that point because they're top of mind. So what this shows is actually you need both. And 
there's quite a lot of data around how the two of them move together. So this one isn't really a model, this is just a method. And I feel like he was maybe taking the mick a little bit when he came up with it. But there is a lot of stuff out there about um, how to approach this. There's, you know, there's all valuable things. There's econometrics and um, MMM for medium modeling. There's lots of ways you can go about this. You can get very complex and very detailed. It can also be very, very expensive to do all this data analysis. But what Ritson said is, well, look, if you just want to just get a blank sheet of paper and have a start at this. Take 10% of your turnover. So step one of the triple cook chips method, as he called it. Take 10% of your turnover. This is based on something else, a lot of research, but Grace, again, Dr. Grace Kai, I'm being a complete fanboy today. Again, Dr. Grace Kai talks about, um, there's a chart out there, which I just didn't have time to go through, which says between five to 15%, roughly about 10% of your turnover when spent on marketing enhances growth. Um, and the newer your business, the more it should be, and so on. That's on marketing, not on brand of it's just marketing as a whole. Then apply the long and the short of it, so you've got that money. Say it's 100,000, 60,000, 40,000. Um, then you start to activate it, and you measure the, both the short-term ROIs uh, and also the long-term benefits. Now, short-term ROIs, you might be putting that money in there, and you've got, you're leaving money on the table, so of course you're going to spend more on your performance marketing. But hopefully the profits from that you can do to spend more on your brand marketing. But what Chris Kite says is, and, and, and what I'll go into in a minute, is about, well, that's all wonderful, but it's a model. Okay? It's, it's, it's not meant to be perfect. That's just your starting point. So have a fourth tip and adapt to your circumstances. So why do we adapt to our circumstances? Well, because even in the original Bennett and Fieldwork and since then, they've shown that there's a number of things that affect the mix. For example, your industry in financial services, the baseline isn't even 60-40, or, or as the original data was actually 62-38. It's actually closer to 80-20 brand, which sounds weird, right? Because a lot of financial products are sort of commoditized, but that's why brand is so important. Because if the only thing that's separating you from your competitors is, is, is a point on the APR or a three quid on your car insurance or whatever for those services, then it's particularly important. But it applies for all industries. Um, so you've got to adapt. Also, you've got to adapt to what's happening. We talked about the recession. This is data from Walk. Um, it said, right now, if you want an item, but its price has gone up, what would you do? Well, in groceries, people are going to shop around, but ultimately they're going to buy it anyway. Necessities like household. You know, they might actually defer buying it. They're going to shop around, but they're going to buy anyway, a little bit less. But when you're in things like expensive treats, like electronics, like maybe what Prime Day, a lot of it is about, people are going to be going, you know what, I don't need this right now. You know, I might not need it for another year. Now, there's an argument that you still spend the market at the time, but you maybe your returns are going to be a little while further away. So adapt to your circumstances. Be aware of the picture around you. This isn't perfect vacuum. Equally, <clears throat> through the age of your business, it affects your mix. So from the IPA data bank, 98 to 2018, it showed that actually in the first year, uh, the white in that table is performance. In the first year, it probably makes a lot of sense to get that engine rev in through a lot of performance marketing. You know, a new product, new launches, get a performance marketing thing happening. It's, it's, it's fine, you know, but over time, early growth excludes the first year, but maybe the first few years, that should shape up. And as you become a leader brand, use that, use that brand equity that you've built, use that in your spend, reinforce that, um, you know, fortify forces, build barriers to entry, you know, because for someone to even catch up with you, they're going to spend a fortune in their own brand, they will have the same level of equity. Okay. And then how? So there's a lot to consider, yeah, because all of those things, there's a plus 3% here, plus 2% there, minus 4% there. Um, there's some excellent work by a company called Tracksuit, and they built a calculator to try and uh, take in some of this. I built my own version using AI, which is a whole other topic, but you know, I'm rubbish at code. So using AI, but I built my own one based on all the research that's done and that adapts it based on whether you're innovating or whatever. The link is there. You'll see it in the PDF, but it's on thebanceagency.com, and it's a calculator. So if you're financial services, you can use that. If you're not financial services, go to Tracksuit with the original creators of this sort of thing, and um, but they'll cover more sectors like FMCG and so on. Some considerations with the using models. 
these studies were done by marketers, or at least what people would perceive as marketers. Bear that in mind when you're having conversations with the non-marketers. You know, telling finance that uh, a marketer came up with a brilliant study of why we should be spending more on brand is a bit like trying to convince a steak eater to to switch vegan based on the opinion of another vegan. You know, it's it's not enough on its own. Um, the the studies are biased towards brand because brand was the thing that was not getting enough investment mostly at the time. Um, but the lessons are applicable for both. There's no one size fits all. As I said, you need to adapt things. Don't be dogmatic. You know, the marketing, the leaders in our industry argue with each other about what's right and what's wrong. You know, just take some good theory as your hypothesis and test from there. You know, um, don't argue about it until you've got quite a lot of years under your belt about experience of seeing one method or the other. Um, of course, mixing your budget is only part of advertising. If you have horrific creative, it doesn't matter how much you spend on brand, it's not going to work unless it stands out for being terrible. Um, you know, it's a lot more to it. Equally, if you spend a ton of stuff, ton of money on performance marketing, but you're horrifically unoptimized, then that's not going to work either. Um, but just because you have a great plan, and this is the next section, don't expect the blank check. So be wary of hyperbolic discounting. And this scenario here is exactly what I've been through a number of times. I've created the perfect plan and based on read book after book, cover to cover, all the new analysis, put it into a beautiful deck and still even had the CFO sit up to me and go, you know what, I totally understand what you're saying. I need to tempt some budget cuts if that's all right. So it's not enough on its own. I didn't give the 10% cut, but, but I was asked for it, you know, because you've got to be do more. Because this money doesn't come from pen, it just comes thin air, just because you've made a good argument for it. Okay, It's either got to be increased from the, the profits, essentially, you've got to find it. So your rationale was we're convincing you guys that we need to do this stuff isn't actually probably that hard. All right, it's convincing, it's, it's, I'm just giving you tools to convince others and as well as yourselves. So you need to give it to the CFO, the CEO, so you need to tie into the right language there. But often the budget is being diverted from somewhere else. Now, Within marketing, you might be diverting budget from performance towards brand or from brand activity towards performance, which I had to go through my early career. You know, um, you might have to convince sales that maybe they're going to see a dip if you're moving more towards demand generation than performance and you can't have a budget for both, that they're going to see a dip in the next maybe few months. That's a big fight, you know, but there's lots of evidence out there. In B2B, for example, Cognizant do quite a lot of data on how demand generation works better than just de demand capture. You know, um, you might have to convince your product teams, you have to convince sales. There's a lot to be done here. So how do we go about that? Use the right language. Brand consideration, brand equity, brand, 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 it doesn't matter. Even things like ROAS and CPA to a degree are important and easier to understand, but they're still marketing terms to a large degree. You've got to start using the language of the business. How does this business make money? You know, is it is it a public company? Does it does it have shareholders? You know, there's a lot of considerations here. Uh, the, the middle chart I've got here is talks about a 4% increase in brand equity down the side. And it was a study done and it's in HV, Harvard Business Review. And it says, okay, we did a 4% increase in brand equity. What did that actually mean to these four businesses, our three, three types of businesses and the average across 4,000 brands? And they, they showed it. They had the brand equity scores for all of these brands and then they applied it to uh, what happened. Terms like annual revenue growth. When we did this, there was an annual revenue growth of 1%. Annual shareholder value growth. It's a big one for a lot of companies. Um, and you're often fighting against that when they want to keep their profit margins up that they, they're pleasing the shareholders can be one of the curses against marketing. So you have to show how it keeps the shareholders happy. Uh, but the investment as a percentage of the business, how much more you want than you want. It's not just 3 million, it's I need mm, a bigger percentage of the business's turnover, but it'll net you an even bigger percentage back. Shareholder value, return on investment, and return on investment as a whole. These are all numbers you need to talk about. And they will, as you see, vary. They did vary by businesses, but these are just single examples of businesses, but it does vary. So you're doing that. Data-driven should have been in my list at the top, right? But data-driven um, decisions, uh, this easily said. Here I mean, obviously using data, using performance, but 
But all of these things I've told you, they're just models, right? They're, they're things that have worked for many, many, many businesses, but they're a baseline for your hypothesis. You have to then use them to test. Chances of them giving you, of someone giving you a doubling your marketing budget, spend on brand performance is very, very small. Okay, but can you get 5% to test with? Can you say, well, look, I want, I want you to shore away 10% for me, but I'm gonna spend 5% on the test. And if that's successful, I want the other 5% this year. Something like that. You know, negotiate, give them, a, give them an out if you're wrong. Give yourself an out. You know, as I said, I've said to a board in the past, I'm not in commission here. I'm not spending money for the sake of spending money. I don't get any kickback out of it. You know, I'm spending money because I believe it's the right thing to do. So, but, but back up data and don't take it personally. Be data led. You know, it's not you you don't believe in, it's the marketing, hopefully. Communication language, I've already talked about this, but communication, think about what we talked about. So this is gonna be one of the biggest marketing jobs you're gonna do, okay? Uh, is talk about, um, talking about Baron Sharp at the beginning. 95% of the time, you're not in budget season, okay? So do you just go all out at the finance department when you have to speak to them and you have to get money from them? Or do you spend the year, the other 95% of the time, building a relationship with them? Showing what money does, showing what money doesn't, showing what your theories are, what they're based on, having a relationship, and then explain to you how money works in this business. Keep that communication line open, have a relationship with them, you know, and don't be scared. You know, they have targets just the same as you, and you need to need to understand equally with sales, equally with others. Show what your um, brand equity does for the price elasticity. That was a big one for me, price elasticity. Use lots of charts, but don't make the mistake of taking a chart into a meeting that you don't fully understand. I've done that earlier on and had, a, had, had someone just take it apart and go, well, why did that happen? And they're going, oh, another one. And I nearly included it until I looked at it. It showed absolutely clearly the click-through rate improvement based on brand performance. So if you've got a high brand, you get higher click-through rate. We, this has been proven time and again. But the chart I had showed a 0.68% click-through rate if your brand is number one. Uh, if your brand is number three, and a 0.71% in click-through rate if your brand is number one. Now, it's an improvement, yes, but the chart was massively stretched out. And actually a fans person would go, well, how much did that 0.02% cost me? Just be wary of what you're going in with. Equally, when you mess up and you will, you know, be transparent about it. Understand what you did wrong. Don't brush under the carpet. Don't, don't blag it. Maybe the circumstance is wrong. Maybe your creative was rubbish. Maybe, maybe you misjudged something. You know, be transparent because ultimately these, the, the, you dare to be fight another day, you know, and be better. I'm coming up to time, so I'm going to move to on two case studies in the summary. So this is a case study from um, from the meal in a box kind of category. Uh, Gusto, who many of you will have heard of. Go back, um, go back about ten years or so. They when the whole category started, um, less than ten years really. Um, they were they were very much reliant on paid ads. They had very low brand awareness. And at a certain tipping point, I remember watching, I can't remember his full name, Tom, the CMO there. I remember seeing him in marketing week saying, yeah, we were so deep into performance marketing now, we're gonna move into moving into brand and we have to spend more of our money on brand. So what did they come up with? They decided on a mix of about 60, 40. Now this actually wasn't based on whether it would involve business in the field, no doubt, but it was based on their own data and their own tests. And they settled on a roughly 60, 40% split. That drove people into a demand pool, which then led to you know, tighter acquisition. Um, then of course they get a pool of customers who through word of mouth build network effects, which then comes back into awareness through word of mouth, you know, back into your demand pool. You're creating a machine basically using brand you know it's not no brand is what's driving it so now from 2020 anyway it's not now but around 2020 they were 75 percent organic customer acquisition you know so that's that's a much healthier business a much more sustainable business you know and it's up against people like hello fresh and use that's why it's doing well that was that point and then my final example before we move into questions is my own experience. Um, I started in Admiral five years ago, or six, gosh, six years, I was in Admiral five years, um, and I explained how I started. Price comparison was very dominant, and um, we had an issue where it was very dominant. It's great, the performance, the business is doing exceptionally well, and that was almost a problem. There was no burning platform. 
we had very weak consideration compared to our awareness, 97% awareness, quite low consideration. Um, the impact of brand marketing wasn't known, it was just something you did, and performance marketing was terribly unoptimized. So I did all of this work to, to get increased budget on the ATL, uh, above the line. I had a big review of our creative. We changed our creative entirely. We kept a fluent device, the Lady Admiral, changed everything else, went animated to get greater emotional response. We started to measure, measure what that did to click-through rates and price comparison versus a control brand. We also looked after Elephant and Diamond, so um, they hadn't had any brand investment, so they were my control to test. Um, we also moved brand and performance into one team to balance. Yeah, So they were all into one team with the same budget, uh, worked out differently, and we used method more than being obsessed with the mix. It just happened to settle down a certain way. What was the outcome? Uh, price comparison dependency sort of stabilized, if not dipped. It was going 60, 65, 70, you know, it was going up. It flattened off because just direct marketing was working so much better. Um, our click-through rate from third position, and if you think you've got a price comparison website and you have um, five results, it's like the second or third result. If that's a brand you know, you're more likely to click it, improve that click-through rate. It sounds very dull and very dry, and it's worth millions. Um, our consideration became first in market. This led to the other things. It isn't a result in itself. It isn't a goal in itself. But that's what we were first instead of fifth. And then we also had the lowest direct CPA in the market um, by quite a while. And I know that because there's a, an anonymous benchmarking thing called eBenchmarkers. So, and we did that without so, sacrificing share. Um, this is this model in growth. But yeah, performance impacts, impacts brand by increasing equity, increasing penetration, network effects and awareness consideration. Brand impacts performance by increasing the elasticity, the click-through rates, etc. But what you've got to work on over time, and this little slant here is just like that, just like that um, long and short of a chart, is that it'll take time to improve that coefficient. You know, that the money is energy going into a system. It's not spent and gone. And that's the big conversation you have to have. This money is being invested. Yes, we've all used the investment trick, but it's energy going into a system. And the better you get at these things, the more that energy transfers into the other type of business, so performance, brand, and so on. So in summary, it's a critical time. Performance marketing's matured as a discipline. Um, it's still got some way to go, but it's definitely matured a lot. But our economic conditions are working against us. So we need to be really on this stuff for our business to survive past that and beyond. Um, but it's a great time for marketers. You know, we, we're well respected and we need to be well educated in what's available to us. On that education, the seminal works of, of critical thinking out there. There's tons of analysis now, but you've got to use it as a baseline hypothesis. You can't just rely on it because you won't get buy-in and you might be wrong. So just, just, just adapt. And then finally, teamwork is critical for success. It's not brand marketers versus performance marketers. It's complete nonsense. You know, you're, you're a team. And you really depend on each other and you can really help each other so you work together but also work with a broader business you know to get them buying and whatever you choose to do uh and that's it um this is a reading list don't know if you want to uh move on to questions thanks alex absolutely fascinating presentation um, we will head into uh, Q&A. We've already received some, some great questions um, to get us underway. So thank you for those of you who have sent your questions in. Please do continue to post any questions and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the next few minutes. Yeah, sorry, I ran over. First, <laughs> it's okay. First question. Um, in your projects and, and teams, um, did you always get the budget that you wanted? Yeah, absolutely not. Um, particularly earlier on, I didn't. Uh, I think I, I had a little bit of leeway when I first started that model. They went, well, there's a new guy. We've got to give him some, some rope to hang himself with. So I did then. But after that, you know, I always protected my budget. You know, we, we often would ask for like a 10, 15% cut and I'd get away with a couple of percent. Um, I often got budget with new products on based on this building consideration because newer businesses are in some ways easier to grow. So no, I didn't get it all the time, but I got better at keeping it and then sometimes increasing it as time went on. Um, yeah, but it's not flawless. You know, you've got to think of the bigger picture. Right, thank you. Um, and another question that had come in was how 
would you advise justifying to board members that are investing in branding um, for a product portfolio that it's it's worth it in the long run, um, especially that it is difficult to quantify compared to other tactical marketing activities? I mean, that's that's kind of the last section, but. So for me, I I noticed, and I had to rush through that a little bit because I, I was conscious, but what I did is tie to elasticity. So what I said was consideration over time. So where our activities should build a relationship which will grow consideration. That's meaningless to the CFO, but it's the number that we start with and we can directly improve. This consideration in many, many studies is correlated to improve click-through rates or improve performance. So take your performance channel and go, well, what's the big what's the big metric that we're targeting there? CPC, CPA, CTR, whatever. How can it tie to that? And and talk about logically. If you have to convince yourself, then you're not ready. Um, look out there what's happened. There, I've, I've mentioned that Zhang do a really good report. I've done a really good paper on it. You've got to take your brand metrics that you can immediately influence through brand activity and then show how they tie to performance metrics and then show how those performance metrics tie to profit or elasticity or whatever it might be. You're talking in future cash flow, you're not talking in just having a luxury. Okay, great, thank you. And and talking of um, those metrics that you mentioned, there were a couple of questions that came in asking what metrics would you um, say are the core ones to analyze performance? performance uh, I don't know I'm a bit old school and I well for a couple of years with a with a, like a 14 or 30 million pound budget we tend to look at two metrics above all which were your cost per acquisition and your you know volume against target right uh, and budget was not really something we measured the reason for that was because well we needed to hit a certain volume but we, there's no point hitting it if you're losing money on every customer um, T ROAS is a big one in performance marketing these days. Target ROAS, sorry, um, and return on ad spend, sorry. Um, it can be quite short termist, um, and you can solve for it, so it's a bit risky. But it is they're all useful metrics. But I, I'm, you know, like I said, ROI, CPA. Ultimately, what can your business afford to spend on a customer, and that's how you ascertain the KPIs from that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I think we've probably got time for another question. Um, this is around kind of the how um, smaller organisations, um, what your experiences of those, and whether or not you find that um, any smaller organisations that may not have um, as robust a marketing structure, whether they lean on performance marketing and ROI more than the longer term brand focused marketing. Mm, it, it's a hard one, no, because. Someone said to me once, you can, it's easy to run an efficient corner shop, okay? So you can get very good at being a very small, efficient business, and that's fine. If you just want to maintain the status quo, that's fine. There are other ways to build relationships with your brand that are beyond just going on TV or spending a fortune. You know, brand, brand advertising and, and YouTube and valuable content, there's nothing to do with sales. Is brand advertising, right? You're establishing authority. Definitely do that stuff because if you don't do it, your competitors will be doing it. And it's you know it's, it's whiz weird. I'm, I mean, I'm a consultant as I'm running an agency, and I go to electrical engineering firms, and I say, you know, you, you need to be doing more than just trying to hit people when they they need electrical engineers. And they go, well, what am I going to do? Well, be on LinkedIn. Talk about what you think is important in the market because your little audience cares. You know, your niche will care about that. It's not about just speaking to them when you want money out of them. That's building brand. It doesn't have to be some fancy advert. Um, be more to customers than just a transaction point. That's that's what brand is. So yeah, I don't think you have to rely. Performance marketing gets the wheels running and it keeps the money coming in, but you have to be doing more because one day you're going to find that it gets very, very hard and your business will not grow, but your business will want to grow and you won't be able to achieve it for them. Amazing. Thank, thank you so much, Alex. That's fantastic. And I think, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for for the webinar today. I would like to thank Alex once again and also to CIM Wales Committee for organising the webinar. So that just leaves me to say a final thank you to you for joining us today. We do hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Take care, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon.